and uh, yeah so we are going to keep this session uh, very interactive so i would like to make sure we have uh, everybody uh, participating and also speaking uh, and again i don't have too many slides so it will be more of a learning session from each other more like a workshop yeah so that's what we are going to do and uh, shan already introduced me uh, again uh, my name is uh, karthik chidambaram and um, i run this company called uh, dc cap it was started in 2005 we bootstrap we just started with uh, two desks two people and uh, two computers made a lot of mistakes and uh, and uh, grew along the way and like shan mentioned i love traveling i uh, love reading and also learning new things okay and uh, yeah if you want to reach me here's my contact it's not that difficult to reach me yeah cool so this is actually a podcast i just shared uh, masters of scale uh, so did you guys uh, get a chance to listen to that podcast how many of you listen to that podcast anybody No, sir. Karthik, you didn't listen. Okay. Anybody else listen to it? Yeah. No. Okay. No problem. So that's fine. So we're just going to. How many of you are familiar with Airbnb? Okay. So I think Pushpa Ali is familiar. So Pushpa Ali. Okay. Anamla, you listen for about twenty minutes. Okay, that's good. So, Pushpa, you want to tell about Airbnb? Do you know what it is? Uh, so, Airbnb is a bed and breakfast uh, based company, which uh, kind of I think allocates a uh, free space in a house to external individuals who can come and occupy it if they so wish to. And I think it's a, a unicorn startup that is has raised uh, multiple. million dollars in funding and is currently uh, severely hit by the covid pandemic but uh, 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 they are a bread and breakfast company was what uh, i know of it right okay cool so that's good so thank you uh, so how did you know about airbnb i'm just curious yeah you're on mute i don't hear you Yeah. So, so uh, I came across the founder's profile, Brian Chesky, at some point, and then I think I just read up a little bit on their story multiple years ago. So that was uh, okay. how I did. Yeah. Okay. okay. What about you, Anamali? Thank you, Pushpani. What about you, Anamali? So, where did you come across, or did you know about Airbnb earlier, or? Uh... Yeah, you're on mute. Yeah, can you hear us? Yeah, I think you're on mute. Okay, anybody else uh, wants to talk about Airbnb? Mm hmm. Yeah, go ahead, singer. Yeah, I know Airbnb because uh, they were the ones they identified. Like it's kind of an OEO kind. and uh, they were the persons who launched internationally first time and this concept made be, uh, made a big hit and uh, they were like uh, pitched in in australia in a multiple times and uh, they got uh, tremendous growth within one year itself so i know about them by that way okay. and uh, yeah okay excellent did you happen to listen to the podcast or no no okay cool okay. all right cool guys so i think uh, it's very interesting um, so like uh, pushpavali or uh, singaravel mentioned so airbnb is more like a hotel okay so or something very similar to the oyo rooms in india but it works a little differently let's say i have a house and let's say i have three bedrooms in my house and i'm just using two bedrooms and if i want to rent out one of those two bedrooms uh, then i can do it so i can make some extra money in the side okay so that's essentially what uh, airbnb is 
and the podcast i shared with you okay uh is about airbnb i'm going to play some snippets from the podcast and we're going to listen in right now and uh, let's uh, discuss that okay just give me one second Okay, I'm going to play the audio so that all of you guys can listen to it, and then uh, let's uh, chat about it. Okay. How you do it? Can you guys hear the audio? Are you able to hear it? Yes, sir. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. This is Masters of Scale. I'm Reid Hoffman, co-founder of LinkedIn, partner at Greylock, and your host. On this episode. I'll make the case that the only way an organization can truly scale is to first do things that don't scale at all. I'll try to prove that theory through stories from some of the smartest entrepreneurs I know. Over the last 20 years, I've worked on or invested in many companies that scaled to 100 million users or more. But here's the thing. You don't start with 100 million users. You start with a few. So stop thinking big and start thinking small. Hand serve your customers, win them over one by one. Now this may sound like odd advice if you're an entrepreneur with global ambitions. Mark Zuckerberg didn't personally invite 1.8 billion people to Facebook. He built a great product and the users just poured in, right? Not exactly. On this show, I'll dispel that myth by talking to founders who fought to win their users. I'm starting with Brian Chesky, CEO of Airbnb, because he epitomizes the idea of handcrafting the user experience before you start to scale. It's a principle he first absorbed. Okay. So you guys are able to listen to it or hear it? Yes, sir. Yeah. So what is he talking about here? So who's talking? Co-founder of LinkedIn. Correct. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so what is he saying? And I'm like, so uh, he was initially trying to stay like, uh, you know, it's not about the numbers initially because uh, like I gave an example about Facebook, it's just a product that reaches numbers. So in order to make up that product as a perfect one, we have to start with small and stop thinking big and uh, go with the smaller numbers and try to start perfecting it. That is the gist of whatever he talked. Excellent. Cool. Great job. Uh, so you said uh, you, were, uh, you were working, right? Which company? I work with Ralph Lauren. Oh, Ralph Lauren. Okay, yeah, yeah. We talked about it in Bangalore. Okay, cool. Okay, excellent. Uh, so the co-founder of LinkedIn. Uh, so anybody wants to add to that? What Anamalai said. Anybody has a different thought? So what else is he saying? Make your product better. Okay, but how do you make your product better? Like pitching for small kind of uh, small small features first, and then your uh, users will be automatically coming in when you develop your products. Yeah, yeah you more should... than small feature. Yeah, yeah. Get to know your What's customers. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you should get to know your customers well, and yeah, Karupaya. So you have a very nice background. Yeah. So yeah, now we can see. Yeah. Okay, that's what I was gonna say. Okay. So like uh, it, told, it tells like you should get to know your customers and each and everything like you should do it very painfully. Uh, like that is the essence of handcrafting. Like, like instead Correct. of doing it and typing it in laptops, if you do it by hand, like you'll get to know the true essence of what customers need. And that is something like could be used to compete very well. That is something excellent, like, excellent, okay. excellent. So you listen to the podcast or you just listen to it right now? I listen to some part of it. I think I listen to some okay. 60 to 70 minutes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Excellent. So that's exactly what it is. Yeah. So do it by, what do you do it by? 
by and simply everything by and, and. yeah yeah so don't worry about to... scale yeah <laughs> yeah start small right um, so that's good anybody else that's really excellent excellent observation i think we have had some really good observations that's very good so what anomaly said or karpia said or even singaravel said is good anybody else so who's he going to talk to so reed offman is going to talk to who um brain chesky brain chesky okay cool okay so let's uh, move on give me one second Okay, listen to this. So what do you mean? I said go to your users, get to know them, get your customers one by one. And I said, but that won't scale. For huge millions of customers, we can't meet every customer. And he said that's exactly why you should do it now because this is the only time you'll ever be small enough that you can meet all your customers, get to know them and make something directly for them. Brian and his co-founders followed his advice to the letter. We literally commuted to New York from Mountain View. So we would be in Wycom Air for uh was it two night dinners? And then Wednesday, Joe and I would go to New York. We literally would knock on the doors of all of our hosts and we had their addresses. And we say, knock, knock, hello, hey, this is Brian, Joe, we're founders, we just want to meet you. It's a little creepy just to knock on the door unannounced. We need excuses to get in their home. So they came up with an offer that the host couldn't refuse. We'd send a professional photographer to your home and photograph your home. Of course, we didn't have any money and we couldn't have employ photographers. So Joe and I, we'd show up at their door and they're like, wow, this company is pretty small. These home visits became Airbnb's secret weapon. It's how they learned what people loved. It's really hard to get even 10 people to love anything, but it's not hard if you spend a ton of time with them. So if I want to make something amazing, I just spend time with you. And I'm like, well, what if I did this? What if I did this? What if I did this? From those questions, a handcrafted experience is born. We'd find out, hey, I don't feel comfortable with the guest. I don't know who they are. Well, what if we had profiles? Great. Well, what do you want your profile? Do well, I want a photo? Great. What else? I want to know where they work, where they went to school. Okay. So you add that stuff. And then you literally start designing touch point by touch point. The creation of the peer review system, customer support. All these things came from us literally we didn't just meet our users, we lived with them. And I used to joke that when you bought an iPhone, Steve Jobs didn't come sleep on your couch, but I did. Okay. Cool. So, what is he talking about here? Yeah, good. Okay. Uh, so what are they talking? About? Yeah. So uh, what uh, Chiski was saying is that about how to get things handcrafted, like how they initially started out uh, when they had literally just ten people who wants to rent out their places. So how they uh, went out door to door, and their way of approach, like you know, nobody lets you in just like that. So. how they they uh, draft a ui based on uh, what the person wants like their profile their photo their details and things like that and a marketing strategy of how to enter into people's like they would send you a photographer to pick up your uh, pictures of your home in order to be displayed on the website correct so excellent so so you go to the users so where do you go live Where do you where do you run your business? Okay, so you're asking me, or what was in the yeah podcast? yeah yeah? I'm asking you, or no? I mean, or uh, whatever was in the podcast, or where should let's say you are desiring to start a business? Okay, where uh, it's about the, the the target audience, where uh, uh, where our targeted customers are basically. That is where we would want to be. Correct, excellent. So where do these guys go? uh i think that was to new york or uh, from mountain view to new york i guess correct so we just went there and uh, that's good so awesome and i'm like i think it's really great observation so who wants to share more thoughts let's ask shaul the priya so what do you have to say yeah so like they wanted to get to know about the users uh since the scale is small it will be easy for them to know the users better as in like he gave an example of how like steve jobs didn't go into their houses and you know talk to them about the iphone 
but wherein uh, they did Grencheski and team. So yeah. Okay, excellent. So that's really good. Uh, so do do you see an advantage of doing that? Yeah, like starting small yeah. and then go. But why should you start small? Uh, to make a better product uh, based on the needs of the users. Okay, that so that. that's excellent. So how, how would you make a better product uh, and how will you understand the needs of the user by starting small? You should understand your customer and uh, even they will be giving you our inputs, right? Correct. Uh, you're able to meet face to face. You're able to essentially handcraft the experience. Yeah. From those data we can make. Excellent. I like it, guys. So cool. So that's good. So thank you, Shahrukh, and thanks, Singaravo. Anybody else wants to add anything to that? Meena, you want to add anything? Yeah. So when you start small, uh, is when you really get the you're crafting your business then to scale up someday. So when you start small, you have the time to make things right right now itself by getting um, to know your customers and what they want exactly and crafting your product based on their suggestions. Like now uh, you can just send out forms to hundreds of people, but we don't know is that what they really want or looking for. It differs from going to door to door and talking to people your users of uh, what can be done better to your product. So when your product base is strong and then you can get more customers through that. So cool. that's the advantage. Excellent. Very good. So I like it. So can you give me an example of a company where you have seen who's done that outside of Airbnb? Customer segmentation is done by all the telecom networks as well as all the banks. No, I'm talking about not customer segmentation. I'm talking about handcrafting. Okay. So like, uh, for instance, I do everything by hand and then I start uh, making it a little bigger. So any company, you know, who's uh -huh. done that? I'm not sure on any specific company, but in a general food industry would be a perfect example for this. So whenever some uh, bigger chefs or anybody start up, they start a restaurant, they come to their own customers' tables and check how their food was and was it really healthy, good, the service was good. How So that is uh, that would be a good example here in this case to match it up. So that's a great example. Yeah, food industry, restaurant. Yeah, so you go check how the food is. Why should you go check how the food is? Uh, because there are two perspectives for everything. So one is from the chef's perspective, if you say, like uh, they made it based on what they had in their mind, like uh, infusing of elements and things. But then it's a customer's perspective, which is most important over there in order for it, for the product to, you know, get perfected. So uh, they take up reviews, they start tuning their, uh, like ju just say in the case of restaurants, it's about the food. In case of any other company, it's about their products. So that is how okay. they tune up their products to perfect and reach out more people. Okay, excellent. I like it. Anybody else has examples of any other companies who do that? WhatsApp. Which one? What? WhatsApp and other applications which they build very small and uh, automatically uh, they develop their products, they upgrade their products. And yeah, become... maybe WhatsApp handcrafted, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Amazon, so Meena Ramanathan, you want to talk a little more about it? I think that's actually a great example. Yeah, Amazon started out very small. Uh, he, I think only three of them together started out the entire uh, thing only mm. for books. And then they slowly, gradually opened up for everything as they mm. understood the market out there and how the world is going to completely get digitalized. So Yeah, I that's a great Amazon, example. Yeah. So do you know what Jeff Bezos did to handcraft? Can you give me one handcrafting story of Jeff Bezos? Um, you were right. I think Amazon is a great example. I mean, again, you know, it's like massive today. Yeah, but then, uh, I'm not uh, exactly sure mm -hmm. uh, if this is a handcrafting example, but then he took over many small companies uh, until Amazon became one. So there were many different uh, companies only for shoes, only for books and uh, many other sectors separately. So he took over all of them as they were small 
and then finally made amazon into one uh, huge sector where everything is available okay so what do you guys think what did mina say so is that handcrafting or that's not handcrafting uh, i don't think that's exactly what handcrafting means it's about correct. acquiring so, acquiring business yeah. correct so that's acquisition yeah so that's good so i'm glad okay any other examples uh, in terms of yeah, what amazon did anybody knows like what jeff bezos did anybody read any stories or anybody so he used to actually uh, so amazon is all also also about shipping correct so you order online and they ship it so what do you think jeff bezos did he took the packages and where did he go probably delivered by himself like he worked as a delivery guy yeah so uh, he took it to ups or usps or the post office he put the label and he shipped it okay or another thing he did is let's say you are ordering a book so what does he do he goes to the store buys the book and ships it that's a perfect example of handcrafting but good job mina so i think it's uh, really good okay so cool let's uh, move on and i'll play a little more of the audio clip was there a particular experience that has really stuck in your mind i remember we met with a couple host and it's winter it's snowing outside and we're like in snow boots and we walk up to the apartment and we went there to photograph the homes and we're like hey i'll upload your photos to the website um do you have any other feedback and he comes back with a book it's like a binder and he's got like dozens of pages of notes and he ends up creating like a product roadmap for us like we should have this 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 and we're like oh my god this is our roadmap cuz he's the customer and i think that always stuck in our mind as the roadmap often exists in the minds of the users you're designing things for it is typical to get very detailed feedback from some of your early users And if you're not getting some people who say this is super important to me. I love this. I really need this to work well. It usually means you're off track. Passionate feedback is a clue that your product really matters to someone, and one passionate user can turn into many if you listen to them carefully. It's essential to get this kind of feedback early while you're still defining the product. It's like setting a foundation as an architect. You wouldn't build a skyscraper before you've built a solid foundation. User feedback ensures you won't build a dozen floors on an unstable swamp. Brian has a simple method for extracting detailed feedback from users. He doesn't ask about the product he already built. He asks about the product of their dreams. We'd ask these questions like what could we do to surprise you? Like what could we do not to make this better but to make you tell everyone about it? And that answer is different. If I say what could I do to make this better, they'll say something small. If I were to say read what would it take for me to design something that you would literally tell every single person you've ever encountered? So you start to ask these questions and it really helps you think through this problem. It's essential to seek out and listen to user feedback. But the caveat is you have to figure out which users to listen to. You can have different kinds of Okay. So what is he talking about here? There are a couple of things uh, which is being discussed. So what is he talking about here? Let's ask somebody. so let's ask valikano alagapan yeah want to say something what is he talking about here okay i think you are on mute not able to hear you so i'm going to go to purna and i'm like um yes yes Yeah. I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's he's talking about surprising the customer. Yeah. Okay. Surprising the customer what else? Before surprising he spoke about something else. What are you talk about? Um I joined in when the podcast is playing. I didn't hear the first bit. I'm so sorry. Okay, no problem. So before uh, surprising customers, what else did he talk about? Surprising customers is important. 
Okay, it's another important thing you talked about. Okay, I think uh, Karpaya, yeah. Yeah, he, before surprising, there is something like what their expectations are and simply it's not like, a, it's not about expectations. It's about like what they dream. So if you like give them uh, what they dream, like that's a total package, uh, adding to it some war factor, like it could uh, become a surprise, no? Okay. Absolutely, about okay. That, yeah, so okay, there are two parts to this. So that's very good. So you're talking about wowing the customer and uh, making sure that you provide an awesome experience. Hey, what can I do to surprise you? Okay, so that's something he definitely talked about. Okay, so that's good. Anybody add, wants to add any comment on that? What Karpia said? Any comments? Okay, um, so just uh, one more, adding to what Karpia said. So uh, a part of warming and the other part was about uh, user experience, like how to, uh, how, uh, how much details that they require, like uh, the recent terms that we use UI or UX experience, how to design it up, uh, like how you open it up, things like that. Okay, cool, excellent. So that's a good point. So how do you make the user experience better? So let's ask Meena, Meena Ravindran, yeah. So yeah. what do you so make, we the user make the user experience better? Yeah, we make the user experience better from the feedbacks because we are not the end users. We go to the customers, we ask them like, uh, why would you recommend a product? Uh, what would you want in a product to be recommending it to someone? Or what do you find perfect in a product to use them? Because uh, there, there might be hundreds of competitions for us and why we should be the best is we give them the best user experience, what they want and not best from our perspective of what is the best. So it's uh, totally on the feedback of what the customer wants. And there might be someone with the same idea as um, what we have started the business with, but they might have more inputs than what we have and they might be our customer. Like just how that person had a binder full of ideas for them to improve on and work on. So we can always listen to customers' feedbacks and make ourselves better. Okay, excellent. That's exactly the word I was looking for, uh, feedback. Yeah. So that's excellent. So you had already listened to the podcast or uh, this is when you're listening? Uh, this is the first time I'm listening. Okay, cool. All right. So, yeah. So feedback is the key word. Okay. Anybody who wants to talk about feedback, guys, I think this is very important. I mean, it actually applies everywhere, uh, both at work and at your personal life or in business. So anybody wants to talk about feedback? Yeah, uh, we like, yeah, like yeah, okay. yeah, so it's yeah. like uh, creating a product, it's like more of a, trial and error process rather than uh, something like doing something awesome just like that it won't come. So something like constant feedback is very much needed. Uh, in our architectural execution also, like each and every week we have a crit, like wherein they'll be giving us feedback as to how to improve our product like that. So we, uh, we carry it out like as a three to four month design process. Correct, so, yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's it's a great example. Feedback. I think even uh, the architecture we talked about is a great example. So just listen to the user feedback, okay? Yeah. And you can learn from it. And if somebody gives you feedback, are you able to take it in a positive way or how is it? I'm just curious. Uh, for us, it's our preferences. So they like, like, uh, like other normal teachers, they'll give it in more in a negative way. So we have to like process it a lot more and it, uh, yeah. it, uh, to be Frank, it will be like very anxious and all, but mm. coming to the normal customer, it's, uh, it's a layman, normal layman. So mm. it will be more, it will take it in a more positive way. Actually, we can solve it more in a better way. Do you take every feedback given or do you pick and choose? We should pick and choose. Excellent. Yeah. Cool. That's very good. Yeah. And I think he also talks about that in the podcast a little later. Okay. Anybody else wants to add anything on the feedback? Yeah, okay. 
let's move on let me uh, play but i think this is very interesting i'm really glad uh, that uh, some of you have really got this very well so feedback is like a low hanging fruit i would say so always listen to your customers yeah so and i think um, some big guys some big entrepreneurs they stay on the ground they always are very very curious uh, to listen and hear uh, feedback and also they say feedback culture is very good let's say you start a business or even in your company let's say your boss or anybody you know is not doing a good job what do you do you give them feedback if they do a good job you give them feedback as well yeah so feedback is very important yeah okay let me play of users giving you feedback and some of it will take you in the wrong direction so you need to exercise judgment in discerning will this particular user and particular feedback lead me to the mass market or is it an edge case for example at linkedin we had one group of users who invented a name for themselves they call themselves lions which is linkedin open networkers because their theory of the world was that everyone wants to directly connect to everyone else in the world because that's the way they wanted it but they're actually not the majority case a lot of people who are very busy who have access to resources who have some celebrity status do not want that and if we followed their feedback linkedin would not be where it is today we had to steer away from a bunch of passionate users who told us very yeah i think this is something karpia touched about touched on already so he's talking about listening to user feedback um so let's ask um, i think it's nina ramanathan yeah so what did oh, what is that you want to add anything here to this yeah can you hear us okay cool so anybody else wants to add anything i think karpi already touched upon it may i yeah yeah go ahead uma yeah so you might have a future vision on how to direct a business so if a particular review is not going to align you to that path it might you might as well not take that review into account so that will not lead you to where you want to go further correct so what do you do so what should we do so we just take into account those reviews will which will actually make us better and bring out more better quality to the customers and provide more better service to the customers and in in turn it will enhance our service to them okay excellent i agree so yeah so you just uh, do what is uh, what works for you you don't have to take everything and whatever is good for your business you just take it yeah can you guys give me an example of any company you know who takes feedback in a very positive way and implements lazada sorry yeah which company sorry sir uh, lazada yeah. is a company in online lazada Uh, it's a Malaysia online company thing. So, so what do they do? They will sell the phone case, everything you want, home accessories, like something like that. So they will sell it for the low price as they can. So yeah. Okay, but do they take feedback? Yes. When when I if. Uh, If I didn't get the package very soon, I'll send one message. They'll feedback very fast as they can. So, if you ask me, Lazada's the feedback in Malaysia. If you are, uh, so yeah. Okay, cool. So they take feedback seriously. Okay. Anybody else knows anything else? Any small business? Anything you guys know? I don't know about the small business, but Zomato takes it seriously at times. Okay. <laughs> cool. I think Zomato takes it seriously. Okay, cool. I mean, I mean, maybe that's one of the reasons why they are big. Yeah, and Uber as well. 
Yeah, Uber is another great company. Yeah, so they mm-hmm. take feedback very seriously. Also, with those data, only we do analytics and all the other stuff Correct. to improve their own business. Correct. Mm-hmm. Cool. So you are working in data analytics, you said? Yeah, data analytics uh, and data science. Okay, cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Who's that? Who's that? I I've noticed in Nike, which is an e-commerce uh, retailer for cosmetic products, they do take a lot of uh, 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 customer feedback very seriously. What's the name of the company? Nike. N Y K A. N Y K A. It's a Bangalore-based company, and they are going for IPO right, right now. Oh really? Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> they are actually pitching around four hundred crores. Wow. Cool. That's very very interesting. So maybe that's why I think you know it's very interesting to spot such companies, somebody who takes feedback uh, seriously and uh, you work on it. I think that's amazing. Yeah. Cool. All right. So good to know about Nike. So thanks for share. Okay. So let's move on. Okay. Hold on. Trying to decide on the doable thing, he said. Settled on a service with the appropriate level of magic and started building it. And here's the next thing to notice: they didn't launch perfectly scaled services; they built everything by hand. We had a saying that you would do everything by hand till it's painful. So Joe and I would photograph homes till it's painful. Then we get a photographer. Then we'd manage them with spreadsheets till it's painful. Then we got an intern. I don't think I knew how anything would grow to the level that it did. That's Ellie Thiel. She's the intern who managed those spreadsheets. She still works at Airbnb. Very manually, I would email the photographer and the host and connect them. And the photographer would then send me the photos. Um, I would go through each one, giving feedback if they needed to be retouched. And then I would manually upload them to the host's website, their listing, one by one. It would take hours to upload. Multitasking was the name of the game. And then we would automate the tools to make her more efficient. And we kind of looked at this and we said, okay, what is the easiest thing that we can automate? Any little thing that changed was, you know, quite a shift in what I had been doing, but for the better. And I remember one day, Brian would come to me at the end of every day. How many did we get? How many photos were shot? And it was like, oh gosh, I have to go through and count all of these. And then eventually a system does everything. We build a system where now a host comes, they press a button, it alerts our system, which goes to a dispatch of photographers. It's all managed through technology. They get the job, they mark it through an app that we build, and then payment happens. The whole thing is automated now. Note how they gradually worked out a solution. They didn't guess at what users wanted. They reacted to what users asked for. And then they met the demand through a piecemeal process. And here we come to the true art of doing things that don't scale. It's not just a crude way of succeeding on a shoestring budget. Okay, excellent. So what about Sharda? What do you think? Do you have any thoughts here? Uh, So they're talking about how they started everything uh, by hand and how they created an app later. So the step-by-step process and how they came out. Excellent. So what exactly are they doing? They're doing things by hand. And then what are they doing again? Like they're doing things by hand, like, you know, clicking pictures, uploading it in websites and then counting them at the end of the day. But later, like reacting uh, to the what the users want, like they built a system, an app, so that they themselves could do what they were doing before. Excellent. So, and then they shift to automation. Yeah. You know? So that's excellent. Uh, cool. So anybody wants to add to that, that's actually a great observation. So you do things by hand and then you just move it to automation, to systems. Yeah. Naga, you want to add anything? Naga, Kaila? Yeah. What about Mahesh Nachiapan? You want to add anything? I just noticed a point that uh, they actually uh, 
did not give what users wanted but mm. they gave what uh, they asked for but but in their own way and the company Correct. thought process so. so they gave what they asked for in their own way okay cool okay and what exactly do you do again magesh i missed it uh, I, I, can you remind me again so you are studying correct yeah what are you studying again i'm i'm passing my uh, second year undergrad undergrad okay yeah cool okay anybody else wants to add anything to that so they are switching from handcrafting see handcrafting is the first step you do everything by hand and after handcrafting what do you do you automate things anybody wants to add anything do you guys agree uh, with this approach yeah go ahead yeah so uh, it just indicates that something uh, started as a handcraft but then depending on the expansion and the market things so obviously how they transition to the automation so a uh, handcraft is important but handcraft is not that is always can be applied everywhere excellent no absolutely so that's just the starting point and then you just uh, move on okay cool excellent so let me just play another piece hold on okay listen to this to build the features that users really want i've seen this hand crafting story play out over and over again with entrepreneurs take my friend patrick collison He's the founding CEO of Stripe, an online payments company. Today, thousands of businesses use Stripe to process payments from their online customers. But in the early days, they were a scrappy startup, and Patrick paid close attention to his users, very close attention. We had a chat room uh, where we would just help customers with, well, whatever issue they they wanted to ask about, and we were very distressed after a while to notice that occasionally people would come into the chat room while we were sleeping and ask a question, and you know, they wouldn't get any response. and so we wrote a bot that would just page one of us um uh, if somebody asked a question they didn't get a response after more than 30 seconds or something and someone would kind of groggily bleary eyed wake up and like help them out and then go back to sleep so in addition to being ceo patrick had become stripe's bleary eyed customer service rep frustrated users would page him at all hours it sure did not feel glamorous you just tapping away on my laptop for half an hour in bed Actually, it reminds me. I don't know if you know Paul English, who founded Kayak. Kayak is an online travel service that finds the lowest available rates across different websites. Uh, we, we we know each other a little bit. Yeah, Paul, um, for a number of years in Kayak, had his cell phone number as the customer service number. Ah, uh, we we also had one of our. Uh... That's interesting. So, anybody wants to add to that? What did uh, What are they talking about here? so they're talking about customer support yeah so uma you want to add anything so what are they listing they are listing somebody's number what number are they listing So it was yeah, Patrick's own cell phone number, I guess. Excellent. So why are they listing the cell phone number? For a customer support program. So whenever they had a query or they wanted to reach out regarding any problems about the product or uh, that case. Absolutely. So I think that's actually a great thing to do. Would you agree? anybody knows any businesses who do that where they just list the phone number and you call and you call the owner yeah anybody knows of any businesses where they just list the number and then the owner picks up is that a good thing yeah So Pushpa, do you want to say something? Yeah, you're on mute.
Yeah, can you hear us? Okay, I'll let you figure out your mic. Okay, Karupi, are you want to add anything to this? Uh, in terms of listing the phone number and everything. Uh, much I know about it, but. So you think it's a good idea for customer service? Uh, yeah, I think it's better if they know the numbers because uh, with the same customer, uh, calls again. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. So okay. If, uh, if cool. we come up, we can actually like uh, earmark that customer that is going to come up with this kind of complaints. So we could directly solve that out. Okay, cool. All right. So let's listen to the last piece of this audio and then we can move on. Hold on, okay the handcrafted work. Here's a surprising message for entrepreneurs who have only a handful of users to serve. I kind of tell a lot of entrepreneurs who don't have traction, I miss those times. I mean, yes, it's exciting to have traction, to have a super like company that's like huge scale, but the biggest leaps you ever get is when you're small. And another way of saying it is your product changes less, the bigger you get, because there's bigger, more customers, more blowback, more systems, more legacy. The most innovative leaps you'll ever make often especially for your network, are going to be when you're really, really small. You can change the product all, all entirely in a week. Try doing that at LinkedIn or Airbnb today. That'd be a huge disaster. So I think taking advantage of that subscale, designing the perfect experience, asking yourself what you could do is amazing. And if you have a teeny startup, I have good news for you. Now is the moment you can take the most daring leaps of your career. Dream big and act small. Pay passionate attention to your users. Handcraft the core service for them, create a magical experience, and then figure out what part of that magical handcrafted thing can. What do you guys, what do you think guys? So that was the last piece of this podcast. So anybody wants to add any comments? So being small, is that good or not good? Anybody has any thoughts? Yeah, so when you're small, when you start up small and uh, you have a product in your hand, you go to the customers and get their feedbacks. When you're small, only you're designing your actual product to scale up with all the feedbacks that you get from your customers. When you're finally done or uh, designing your product, it might be a boring product too, but with the customer's feedbacks, it might get better and it might reach to a lot of people. So when you're small, it's very important that that stage is very important because you're designing your business, you're designing your product, you're designing everything. So that's what he, even he said. Excellent. So when you're small, small is beautiful. When you're big, being big is better. Yeah, cool. So that's good. Uh, anybody else wants to add any other comments on this? So that's actually, I think what Mina said was perfect. So then, I mean, I think uh, let's say Everybody wants to get big, obviously, but then you also have to cherish that uh, time when you are small. Let's say you don't have anything, that's good. If you have everything, that's a problem. They say, if everything comes your way, you're on the wrong runway. Have you guys heard that? So you need challenges. And if it's, it's not that easy to, correct? If it's that easy, then everybody is gonna be an Airbnb. But if you can master that handcrafting and if you can master that uh, being small experience, then it makes it very interesting. That's exactly what Mina said. Anybody wants to add any comment? So Anamla, you want to add anything? Any comments to that? Uh, nothing much. So uh, it's just like uh, what you guys told like, being small is not good, but starting small is always good. That is what I would say. Starting small and then go bigger. Instead of you know, and when starting you go tall. bigger, absolutely. When you go big, let's say you become very big. Okay. What do you do? You still um, uh, 
handcraft or you don't handcraft after you become big no uh, so once you become big so we have to automate in order to become big because keeping handcrafting until a certain stage it works like everything has a everything has its own uh, expiry date like even the process or the strategy that we do is at uh, uh, it has a limited period of time which it works beyond that we have to evolve based on the uh, you know the project of the product reach and everything so obviously we're going big handcrafting is not a good option anybody disagrees with anamalai oh, sorry anamalai yes handcrafting is not always about the smallest things and going and looking into the details and doing it by yourself it's not that it's about taking into consideration of every possible way to grow every possible way to become better and optimize your company your structure or even the product so it it's a very, uh, very huge process it's not always about when you're small it's definitely smaller but when you're scaling up it's in a bigger stage so it's no but when you scaled up let's say you handcrafted and you become big yeah. would you still handcraft or would you not handcraft anymore i would still hand, handcraft the things that i still have to handcraft the, like there will always be more things that you have to take care of and handcraft it correct no so you grow it's up like, so yeah I, so i'm i think that's something yeah sorry go ahead yeah. that's what i think i i gave a separate different impression like basically i meant terms of handcraft is like ceo going on the ground and working what i meant but then like what meena said and what you guys were trying to say is that handcrafting is important but in a different way like once the company grows big we give a separate division known as the, you know customer uh, service and that segment is more like your handcrafting part so they talk in with the customer they take in the feedback so everything gets just uh, you divide it into different terms so that is what uh, that matter is correct yeah absolutely yeah so i was just talking to somebody and you know mukesh ambani everybody knows him so he actually sits on interviews so he interviews people i was just talking to a guy who got hired and uh, looks like mukesh ambani came on the phone and he talked to him and that guy was like wow oh, this is amazing so in a way that's handcrafting too because you want to make sure that you get the best people yeah okay guys cool let me share my screen i think that's all i have on this podcast any other closing comments on the podcast anybody has anything else you want to share did you guys enjoy the podcast or how was it did you like it overall okay cool okay so let me share my screen just a couple of slides you guys can see my screen what do you guys see uh the podcast this uh, podcast okay, slide cool. so let's move on so anybody knows who this is let's mm-hmm. ask sorry einstein einstein okay excellent so good i'm glad you know einstein so uh einstein has said a lot of things and he's invented a lot of things but he said something which is very relevant to all of us and uh, let's see what he said anybody wants to take any guess no sir no what does vaddi mean vaddi vaddi Uh, I think what does it mean? Einstein did mention about how compounding interest is the eighth wonder of the world. So, I correct. Yeah, that's right. Let's look at what Einstein said. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. What does it say? Can one of you read it? Compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. Compound interest is the most powerful force in the universe. Yeah. Cool. Anybody wants to add about this? Anybody has any thoughts, any stories, any personal stories you want to share? No, sir. I don't have anything personal. Stories. Okay. What about? Okay. What about other people? 
So why is compound interest the seventh or eighth wonder of the world or the most powerful force? I think a few people here are working, correct? So Anamle is working, Singaravel is working. I think Meena is also working. Anybody else is working? How many of you make money here? A little bit or do some part-time job, okay. So what do you do with the money? I'm just curious actually. Invest on yourself. Invest what? Invest on yourself. Oh, you like, invest on yourself? That's like good. You go for, uh, like, do some courses. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay, that's very good. So let's talk about compound interest. I think a lot of our ancestors, they practiced it very well, uh, looks like. So why is that? You know, what do you think? Anybody who wants to add anything about compound interest? So let's say you have... Uh, 1 lakh rupees, okay, 1 lakh. How long would it take for it to become 2 lakhs? Let's say I give you 1 lakh, you know, I mean, or not me. Let's say you have 1 lakh. Would you like it to become 2 lakhs or you don't want it to become 2 lakhs? Or you want it to become 50,000? What do you like? Shalada Priya, what do you like? Uh, to increase to 2 lakhs. 2 lakhs? Okay, what about... That two, do you want to increase it to four? Yeah. That four, you want to increase to eight? Yeah, yes. And eight, you want to increase to 16? Yes. Okay, when will that happen? How long does that take, do you know? I mean, like, if we have it just like that, it's going to remain as one lakh only. Only if we invest in it, I think it will increase. Okay, let's say you invest in it. Okay, and you... So I think everybody understands what VADI is and what a compound interest is, okay? So anybody has any questions there or you guys are clear? So you're clear? So Anvita, you know, understand? You understand what uh, VADI and compound interest and all this? Oh, actually, VADI and familiar, but compound interest, I don't know. It's the same sure. thing. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. So, okay, now let's let's understand the math behind it, okay? So anybody knows exactly, okay, I'm giving you one lakh and the money is compounding at 10% interest a year. 10% annual compounded a year. When will it become two lakhs? Who knows the answer? Any math geeks here? What about you, Anamli? So I'm giving you one lakh. Okay, Naga. So you're saying it'll compound, it'll become two lakhs in ten months. How can it become two lakhs in ten months? Because it's compounding at ten percent every year. So let's say I give you one lakh. If it's compounding at ten percent a year, if interest is ten percent. How much the money will be in one year? One lakh ten thousand. Excellent. Okay, so good job. So one lakh ten thousand. So that one lakh ten thousand is again compounding at another ten percent the next year. How much will the money be? One twenty two. One twenty two. Twenty two. Okay, yeah. good. So my question is, when will it become two lakhs? How many years will it take? Seven years. Okay. Huh? Seven years. Okay, how did you come up with that number? Uh, basically, we I will be reducing the big picture. So I'll be taking as 10, 11, hmm. 10, then next year will be 11. Then it will turn to uh, 12 and it will be compounding to 13.33 uh, and it will be going to 14.44 likewise. And it takes hmm. around 7 to 7.5 years. Okay, uh, maybe you're yeah. like a math uh, genius. Okay, good. Okay, so I would like to learn from you. Okay, but I think his answer is correct. Uh, so we have to give it to him. Good job. So two lakhs will become in seven years or approximately 7.2. But then when that two lakhs will become four lakhs? It will be six, uh, not six, five years maybe. 
Oh, that once, you, become, uh, four once you increase your years? principal, once you increase your principal amount, automatically uh, the uh, interest also gains in a way where uh, in a higher amount. No, the principal is not is two lakhs. No, after seven years, it becomes two lakhs. Yeah, from two lakhs only. I'm just asking, or uh... yeah, from two lakhs. Okay. From two lakhs, how long does it take to become four lakhs? Let's say I have two lakhs today. So how long will it take to become four lakhs? So Mina, you know. Six to seven years. Six to seven. Okay. That's right. Okay, guys. Um, I think Singaravel did some really good math. Okay, I really enjoyed this. Actually, again, I didn't know about this before. I just got to know about this uh, a little earlier, but it's very, very interesting. Let me share my screen. Anybody's familiar with the rule of 72? Yes. Yeah, you wanna talk about it? No, it's a doubling rate of interest, like uh, whatever the amount is and uh, what is the interest rate uh, which you give. We have to like this is one of the rule, and uh, there is also another rule. Like, uh, if you want to get in an accurate manner, the interest rate into the uh, uh, into some number will be there. I am not getting it right now, but uh, that rule will be like uh, in a perfect manner. Correct. So everybody saw the screen. I'm going to pause the share. Yeah, I think this is very important. I feel. So 72 is the magic number. So let's say your money is growing at 10%. So the time it takes to double is 72 divided by what? 10. So what is the answer? 7.2. Correct, who said that? Uh, Anvita. Okay, Anvita. Okay, cool, good job. Okay, so so 72 divided by 10, what does that 10 signify? That is the rate of interest. Okay, but let's say if my rate of interest, how much rate of interest do they give in the bank? Do you guys know? Approximately five. Five, okay, Magesh. So let's say, I mean, I'm giving you, 5% uh, is the rate of interest. That's what the bank gives you, correct? So that 5%, how long, okay, let's say if the rate of interest is five, based on the rule of 72, how long does it take to double your money? That one lakh becomes two lakhs, how long? Eighteen years. How do you get that number? 72 by five. That's it. So it takes 18 years. So you see how much that 5% uh, difference makes? Yeah. So, and if it's, let's say 9% is the rate of interest, how long does it take? Eight years. That's it. You guys like this math? It's actually a Khan Academy video. So I also included that link uh, in the session. So if you guys uh, have time, you should definitely watch that. I thought it was really, really interesting. Okay. Okay, cool. So, I mean, I think for people who are working or uh, whatever, how many of you have a habit of saving your money? Okay, Anamalai does. Okay, Pushpavali also does. Anybody else? Meena, you don't save money. Singaravel does. Okay, Kartek does, okay. Okay, let's ask Pushpavali. So you save. So what do you do with the saved money? Uh, at the moment, I do invest in certain equity stocks and a couple of mutual funds as well. That's amazing. Okay, cool. So invest in equity stocks and mutual funds. So you pick your own stocks and uh, you pick your own mutual funds or how is it? Uh, so initially, I used to look at external advice, talk to people who are in that space and then invest. But right now, I'm mm. trying to learn a little bit of how uh, one can do our own research, like fundamental technical analysis a little bit, and then read a little bit about the company as well. And I try to. I uh, It's not always worked, but I think it's a little bit of trial and error, yeah. 
So you made a lot of money that way. Uh, we'd like to make more. Okay, cool. That's awesome. You always need more. That's cool. And uh, since when have you been investing? I'm just curious. Uh, I bought my first stock when I was 16, and now I'm 22. So yeah. Okay, so you've been investing since you were 16. Yeah. So I used to invest in my parents' account until I was uh, 18, mm. and then post that, I've been investing myself. I wish I'd really done that, you know, when I was 16 years old. But anyway, that's fine. So what about, uh, I think, you know, so time is the essence. I think, you know, you have started really, really uh, early. So that's awesome. What about you, Anamre? What do you do with the money? Or how do you save? Yeah? I think uh, you're on mute. So yeah, okay, uh, we'll come back sorry. to you. Yeah, go ahead. I had a background noise. So, uh, yeah. Uh, like pretty much like what uh, Pushpoli said. So uh, we put it up in like two to three mutual funds and then uh, equity stocks. So uh, equity stocks, I started up with my master's, but then mutual fund I started recently. Oh, equity stocks, you started when you're doing master's itself? Like when COVID hit and we were sitting at home, like ideal. So I just wanted to do something different. So uh, I learned a little bit about what is stock market and everything. So I started then. So that's the time you started investing first. Cool. And then you also invest in mutual fund. Yeah. Okay. Which company are you work with uh, for mutual fund? Uh, I work with two. Uh, I work with Axis and Media Assets. Axis and? Media Assets. Media Assets. Huh? Okay. Cool. Interesting. Anybody else wants to add anything? So that's good. I think Singaravel. Yeah. How do you save money? Same way. Oh, everybody, yeah? you guys are all pros. No, so you it also is like uh, my father does with Goldman Sachs. Okay. So by that way, I give give it to him and uh, he does it. So you pick and choose, or uh, he picks for you? He picks for me because I'm not familiar with these stocks. Uh, oh, you're not. So he picks for you. Yeah. Okay, cool. What about you, Karpaya? Do you invest? Or do you say, or are you still working or still studying? I'm still studying and I don't invest, but yeah, uh, usually I don't spend so much money. So I think that would be counted as a saving. So you don't spend money? Yeah, not much. Only That's if... very good, actually. Yeah, I also like not to spend money. Uh-uh. I like to only sell, you know. <laughs> That's good. Actually, I think being frugal, I think that's actually something which we can definitely learn a lot from our ancestors in a way, right? You will not know who's a big person, who's a small person. So yeah, it's really, really well, amazing. Yeah. So they'll be very, yeah. very ordinary. And then, yeah. then they'll be really, really big. Yeah. Yeah. Your so needs will be like, it'll be a bit uh, optimum. Yeah. We you call it frugal. Spend a lot of resources. Yeah. Correct. How many of you like to be frugal? I'm just curious. Everybody knows what frugal is? Frugal? What's the Tamil word? Chikanam. Right? So, Pathpath is Correct. So, be very, very careful with the money. You know, don't just spend it. Yeah. So, what about you, Shardapriya? So, I think you're also working. Uh, no, right now I'm studying, so mm. yeah, I don't like I don't save or something. Maybe you don't save. Uh, yeah. So let's say you save money. What will you do with the money? Uh, maybe even I'll explore in investing on stocks and mutual funds. Okay. What about you, Omar? You want to add anything? I've just not explored many saving options yet. But I'm eager to. Okay, cool. All right, that's what we're going to talk about next. Again, I'm not a stock expert and I don't know a lot, but uh, let's talk about uh, this a little bit. So what is this? Can you guys read it? Nifty 50. Yeah, what does Nifty 50 mean? Do you know? It's an equity stock. 
Yeah, it's, it's equally index. stock. It's an index. Index, who said that? Myself, Mayesh. Mayesh, okay, excellent. So uh, are you familiar with Nifty 50 or have you invested? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So why should you invest in Nifty 50? So you have invested in Nifty 50, you're saying? Yes, I, uh, from my parents. Okay, cool, excellent. So why? So what's the difference between, I think, Kanamla, you said you invest in mutual funds, correct? Okay, yeah. uh, so with Access Bank? Yeah. Okay, who told you to invest in mutual fund? Uh, it was actually one of my uncles who advised about mutual fund. Okay, cool. I think it's good. Okay, and uh, what about uh, Pushpavali? You also invested in mutual fund, you said? Yeah, just a couple days. Okay, so anybody advised you or recommended you or you just picked the mutual fund yourself? Uh, so um, I wanted to somehow create a way where I can be a little financially independent. So um, want, uh, someone told me about uh, an SIP and uh, mm. that's when I started putting uh, in a little bit of money and experimenting a little and then. Uh, so you have been doing SIP? Yeah. You so, still do it? Uh, yes, a very, very small meager amounts, yeah. Okay, no, very nice. Cool, uh, no, it's amazing. So what's the difference between index, investing in an index fund and a mutual fund? Anybody knows? Mutual fund is probably uh, investing in a group of stacks where an asset management company invests your money, uh, takes money from all the people and just invests in stocks. Mm. Correct. Different variety of equity stocks. Index, uh, mm -hmm. while the index is uh, where we can buy stocks for ourselves. If we, if we don't want to buy the entire 50 stocks, all the 50 stocks, we can buy uh, stocks for stocks, uh, whatever we need. Correct. It's a great example. So, but can anybody elaborate? Anybody knows? Let's say, I think, you know, I'm glad you guys are investing in mutual funds. That's really good. Yeah. But anybody wants to talk a little more on that? Meena, do you want to talk anything about that? Not much familiar with this topic, so I, I don't know much. Okay, so that's the whole idea. So after this, you're going to start doing this, okay? Yes, I'm definitely going to do it. And then after five years, you're going to call me and tell me, hey, this is what I did. And this yeah, is where sure. I am. Okay, don't forget. Yeah, definitely. Okay, after seven years, okay? So once you double your money, okay. So Anamli, so I think you know it's good that you've been investing in mutual funds. So do you understand the difference between a mutual fund and an index fund? Okay, uh, I'm not sure whether I'm right or wrong here, but my understanding is that you know with the equity fund, it's the specific company that you choose to uh, invest mm -hmm. in. Uh, so uh, mm -hmm. you buy from them, they directly come into your DMAT account and like a mm -hmm. whole lot of scenario there. So whereas in terms of mutual fund, it's like uh, you pay to uh, asset management, uh, like uh, I pay to my access bar people. So they pick up a group of stocks. Like they say, they are segregated between the different categories, like mid caps, small caps, things like that. So based on the uh, uh, like the capitals of the companies and other details. So uh, they invest that amount in a group of companies. So it's like uh, they call it a NAV number of units that you hold the mm. values. Uh, so I'm not still familiar with what that abbreviation means yet. So yeah. Okay. Cool. What about Sharada Priya? Do you want to add anything? Oh, even I'm not familiar with all this. So. Okay. So it's interesting to listen to yeah. it. Or how's... Okay. Cool. All right. I think we have uh, some stock experts too. I think Vignesh Nall is a big stock expert in the room. But um, let me tell you in terms of the difference between a mutual fund and an index fund, okay? So I'll also share a personal story, okay? So there is something called, uh, I think just like Axis, there is ICICI, okay? So I met a guy from ICICI and she said, hey, you know what, just put something. I think a lot of you also get that. Huh? So, okay, cast put a double arrow. Kill you, right? So they tell you, "Danga Tambi, cast pouring hai. You do me panna vana. Maasa maasa na. Now I did by Marshadik ten dollar di Okay. So let's assume now one lakh potential for example. 
அந்த ஒன் லேக் வந்து அஞ்சு வருஷத்துக்கு அஞ்சு லட்சம் போடுறேன் ஓகே ஒன் லேக் எவ்ரி இயர் ஓகே ஃபைவ் இயர்ஸ் நான் எவ்வளோ போட்டிருப்பேன் ஃபைவ் லேக்ஸ் அப்போ எனக்கு என்ன சொன்னாங்க ப்ராப்ளி எயிட் ஓர் டென் இயர்ஸ்க்கு அப்புறம் தே செட் தே கிவ் மீ டென் ஆர் சம்திங் அந்த டேக்ஸ் ஃப்ரீ அப்படின்னு சொன்னாங்க ஓகே ஸோ கேட்குறதுக்கு நல்லா இருக்கா எப்படிங்க இட்ஸ் குட் நீங்கள் கேள்விப்பட்டிருக்கீங்களா அந்த மாதிரி ரைட் ஸோ நிறைய பேர் கேள்விப்பட்டிருப்பீங்க ஓகே ஸோ நான் வந்து சரி நான் ஆக்சுவலாக அகேன் நான் ரொம்ப யோசிக்கல நான் அப்போ வந்து இண்டெக்ஸ் பண்ணுறனாவும் என்னன்னு தெரியாது நான் யூஸ் பண்ணுறேன் சரி நான் வந்து இங்கே இருந்தேன் சரி ஒருத்தன் கேட்டாங்க தெரிஞ்சவங்க கேட்டாங்கன்றதுனால சரின்னு சொல்லிட்டு போட்டுட்டேன் ஓகே ஸோ லெட் சே ஃபஸ்ட் இயர் போட்டேன் அதுக்கப்புறம் செகண்ட் இயரும் போட்டேன் நான் ஆக்சுவலாக போட்டுட்டு நம்ம பார்க்க மாட்டோம்ல என்னென்ன செலவாது எப்படின்றது நம்ம ஜென்ரலாக நிறைய பேர் நீங்கள் பார்ப்பீங்க மேபி இஃப் யூர் ஆல்ரெடி இன்வெஸ்டிங் தென் யூர் சேம் பட் நான் வந்து ஐ வெரி இக்னரண்ட் ஐ டென்ட் நோ எனி திங் ஸோ நான் பார்த்து போட்டுட்டு சரி எல்லாம் பக்கம் ஆயிரும் அப்படின்னு சொல்லிட்டு விட்டேன் கடைசியில் பார்த்தீங்கன்னா நான் அஃப்கோர்ஸ் ரெண்டு லட்சன்றது ஒரு ஒன்று எழுபது ஒன்று எண்பது ஆயிடுச்சு ரெண்டு வருஷம் கழிச்சு ஓகே பட் அகேன் இது த ஹோல் திங் இஸ் நீங்கள் யார்ட்டு வெயிட் பத்து வருஷம் வெயிட் பண்ணணும் அப்போ தான் அவங்க சொல்கிறது கிடைக்கும் பட் படம் நீங்கள் ரெண்டு லட்சம் போட்டு உங்களுக்கு ஒன்று லட்சம் எழுபதாயிரம் ஆயிடுச்சுன்னா பயங்கர டென்ஷன் ஆகும் மட்டும் நம்ம ரைட் ஸோ ஐ காட் ரியலி அப்செட் ஓகே அப்புறம் என்னாச்சு ஐ சேட் ஓகே என்ன பண்ணலாம் அப்படின்னு சொல்லிட்டு எதுனால ஒரு லட்சம் எழுவ நான் போட்ட ரெண்டு லட்சம் எப்படி ஒரு லட்சத்து எழுபதாயிரம் ஆச்சு அப்படின்னு சொல்லிட்டு ஐ வாஸ் திங்கிங் அப்புறம் தான் அவங்க கொடுத்த ஃபார்ம் எல்லாம் கொஞ்சம் படிக்க ஆரம்பித்தேன் ஓகே ஃபஸ்ட் ஃபஸ்ட்டு சைன் போட்டோம்ல அதுக்கப்புறம் டிட் சம் ரீசர்ச் ஸோ ஒன் திங் ஐ ஃபவுண்ட் அவுட் ஓகே இப்போ நான் ஒரு லட்சம் போடுறேன்ல அந்த ஒரு லட்சம் போடுறதுல ஒரு டூ பர்சன்ட் வந்து ஒரு பர்டிகுலர் ஃபீ இன்னும் ஒரு த்ரீ பர்சன்ட் வந்து ஒரு மார்டாலிட்டி ஃபீ இன்னொரு த்ரீ பர்சன்ட் வந்து இன்னொரு ஃபீ அப்படியே போயிட்டு அப்படியே பன்னெண்டு பர்சன்ட் போயிடுது ஸோ ஒரு லட்சத்தில் பன்னெண்டு பர்சன்ட் போச்சுன்னா எவ்வளோ வருது எவ்வளோ இருக்கும் எயிட்டி எயிட் தான் இருக்கு அப்போ அவங்க பணத்தை எயிட்டி எயிட் தௌசண்ட் தான் இன்வெஸ்டே பண்ணுறாங்க என்கிட்ட ஒரு லட்சம் வாங்கிட்டு அது வேறு எனக்கு ஒரு இன்சூரன்ஸ் பிடிச்சி கொடுத்தாங்க பார்த்தீங்களா அவங்களுக்கு வேறு ஒரு த்ரீ ஃபோர் பர்சன்ட் ஃபீ அது வேறு தனி ஓகே இதெல்லாம் நம்ம கிட்ட இருந்தால் எடுக்கிறாங்க ஓகே ஸோ அப்போ நான் என்ன பண்ணேன் நான் அகேன் ஐ டிசைட் ஓகே ஐ டோன்ட் கண்டினியூட் ஐ கேன்சல் இட் அண்ட் தட்ஸ் ஓட் ஐ டே ஓகே பட் த திங் இஸ் த ஃபீஸ் இருக்குல்ல தட் இஸ் வென் ஐ அண்டர்ஸ்டூட் தேட் லெட்ஸ் ஏ வென் யூ இன்வெஸ்ட் ஆன் சம்திங் லைக் திஸ் லைக் த மணி மேனேஜர்ஸ் ஓகே ஸோ தே டேக் அ ஃபீ நத்திங் ராங் ஓகே பிகாஸ் தட்ஸ் த பிஸ்னஸ் லெட்ஸ் ஏ இஃப் யூ ஆர் மணி மேனேஜர் தட் இஸ் குட் பட் ஐ எம் புட்டிங் மை மணி ஒய் ஷுட் ஐ இப்போ நான் பாருங்க நான் என் ஒரு லட்சத்தை உங்கள்கிட்ட கொடுத்துட்டேன் என் பணம் இந்த ஒரு லட்சத்தை மேனேஜ் பண்ணுறது உங்களுக்கு பன்னெண்டு பர்சன்ட் கொடுக்குற மாதிரி கரெக்டா ஸோ தென் வாட் ஐ டேட் இஸ் ஐ ஜஸ்ட் கேன்சல் தேட் ஓகே அண்ட் தட்ஸ் வென் ஐ லேர்ன்ட் அபவுட் திஸ் இண்டெக்ஸ் ஃபண்ட் இண்டெக்ஸ் ஃபண்டில் என்னென்னா உங்களுக்கு வெரி 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 லோ ஃபீஸ் நோ த பாட்டம் மோஸ்ட் ஃபீஸ் ஓகே ஐ திங்க் இட்ஸ் லைக் ஐ டோன்ட் நோ த எக்ஸாக்ட் ஃபீஸ் பட் பாயிண்ட் ஜீரோ ஃபைவ் ஒரு சம்திங் ஐம் நாட் டூ ஷுர் எக்ஸாக்ட்லி பட் அந்த டென் பர்சன்ட் டுவெல் பர்சன்ட் இருந்து பிகாஸ் இட்ஸ் யூ ஆர் பையிங் த ஃபிஃப்டி ஸ்டாக்ஸ் நிஃப்டி ஃபிஃப்டின்னு சொல்கிறோம்ல ரைட் ஸோ யூ பை த டாப் ஃபிஃப்டி ஸ்டாக்ஸ் இன் இந்தியா okay maybe with the mutual fund you might get a higher return i'm not sure okay uh, maybe you will but you are also paying a fee okay so the easier route okay is you can completely i mean you know warren buffett how many of you know warren buffett hmm? so what he says you know he is the biggest investor in the world right so what he says let's say if i am not alive if i am dead and my kids don't know what to do he says that i just put the money in index fund i'll just leave it yeah so you guys uh, get that oh sorry sorry so you guys get that okay so what is this nifty 50 s&p 500 and sip and dollar cost average you know rupee dollar cost average what does all this mean nifty 15 rupee in the i think we talked about it okay so it's the top 50 stocks in where 
uh, Indian National Stock Exchange (NSC). Exactly, top fifty stocks. What is S and P five hundred? Anybody Science. knows? Science was five hundred top stocks. Where five hundred stocks in where? Uh, probably BSC. Yes, yes. No, US in the US. Okay. Okay, S and P five hundred. Okay. And I think uh, I think Pushpavali, you did SIP. So Anamli, do you do SIP or you don't do SIP? No, uh, my mutual fund is a part of SIP. It's not like SIP. Okay, cool. So you guys understand? Everybody understands what SIP is? Yes, sir. Anybody doesn't know? Or why don't you tell people what SIP is? It's a systematic investment plan. Mm -hmm. Where uh, every month we pay in certain amount to them and they buy the stocks for us. Correct. Like, it's just like paying a loan. Yeah. It's the most beautiful thing, actually. But when, let's say you are, uh, what, 22? Okay. Or whatever. Let's say you put the money. When should you take the money out? Anybody has any thoughts? Uh, so people say it like you can keep it years and things, but then in order to be more aware, like it's like whenever you feel like the market is about to drop down, just pull out that money. So uh, the SAP doesn't stop, but the in amount that you invested, you can pull it out so that your uh, initial value doesn't get, just go down. Okay, that's what Anamle thinks. Who agrees or disagrees with Anamle? Okay, so that's what he says. Who disagrees there? Yeah. I don't necessarily disagree, but what I'd like to do is generally buy something and then forget that I bought it. And uh, eventually, when the need does arise, uh, if at any point, then you know, look at uh, any selling. So um, I, I don't know if this works for everybody, but I think uh, it's worked my way a couple of times in the past. So. Okay, good. Okay, that's good. Anybody else? Magesh, you want to add anything? I totally agree with him, but uh, once you have withdrawn, you agree with Anamli? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with him. But you have okay. to once again invest the money when when you feel the market is going to go exactly. up. You have to once again put put, put put back all the funds in. You should not take the money and have it to yourself or spend it. Okay. Like the bifurcation matters. Like how much you put it on, like how Pushpali said that you put it and you forget it, and how much is like a liquid. Like you take it out, you reinvest. You take it out and reinvest. I feel like that bifurcation matters. Okay. Cool. Uma, you want to add anything? Or anybody else? Okay. I disagree with Anamalai actually. Okay. So the thing is, it's more like what Pushpavali said. Okay. Where you put the money and you forget it. Okay. And another thing is, Let's say when it goes up, you want to take the money out. That doesn't also work. See, I mean, uh, that, I mean, I wouldn't say it doesn't, I mean, I think you cannot time the market. How do you know when the market is going to go up and when it's going to go down? Actually, whatever you said is something I did. Okay. So what I did, I mean, um, let's say when that whole thing uh, happened, um, the COVID last year, the market went down, I bought some, correct? And it all went up. And what did I do? I said, okay, you know, let me take the cash out. So I lost 20%, correct? So you don't want to take the money out. You understand? So especially when you invest in an index fund, See, it depends on what category the money is, right? If you're just playing with money or you know, if, if you're really saving, if you want to save, don't take the money out. Do you follow what I'm saying? You put it in an index fund and forget about it. And especially if you start doing it right now when you're 20, time is the most powerful force in investing. That's something I learned recently. So you wait 20 years, you wait 30 years. That will actually be your retirement money. You see what I'm saying? 
maybe it's not uh, easy i mean i think if if i look back let's say if i were to do something that's what i would do so i try not to take the money out yeah you just put the money and just forget it and index fund is better generally i like index fund i don't do anything on uh, mutual at least not yet so and the reason is again i don't want to pay somebody else money to manage my money you understand so why should i i mean you know so it's better to manage your own money i mean you know i mean something of course let's say if it's a certain level maybe you know that's that's a different ball game altogether but generally speaking you don't really i mean i think index funds work very well even if you had put money like if let's say you have been consistently investing you would have doubled your money not in 7 years you know in less than 7 years so that means the money is compounding at more than 10% again markets are very high but they also say that india is in a, uh it it's in a big growth yeah so and that's what sip is sip is like a loan okay anybody knows what a rupee cost or a dollar cost averaging is so that's what sip why do you, why are you doing sip so you're doing sip correct pushkarni So why why should you do SIP? Why let's say you have one lakh, why can't you just put that all together? Why should you just put five five thousand or ten ten thousand? Um, I I do it just merely to bring in some kind of financial discipline of saving. So that's the reason. Correct. That's one. That's a great reason. But another reason too. Okay. Uh, so the other reason is that. If you invest uh, amount at one time, so it buys up the stock in just that one particular period. Just say I invest one lakh right now, and uh, the value of it per unit is like thousand rupees. So I buy the uh, equivalent amount of units. But when I invest in parts like a systematic plan, so it will be like at, at a certain stage the price might be a thousand rupees. At, then the next month it might go down to eight hundred, and then it might again come up to thousand. So what happens is it just keeps up averaging, and in final like. the prices will be when you sell it up obviously you might there high chances of uh, profits there okay excellent so i think that's exactly it. i mean again if you guys i would definitely if there's one thing you can take from this especially i mean at this time of your career these are things you should definitely do close your eyes and do it nifty i mean never close your eyes and do it i mean again nobody can give you investment advice so read about it but this is something this is pretty much like free money i would say okay it's like you don't have to do much you don't have to do anything you just uh, kind of work on increasing so nifty 50 snp 500 sip rupee or dollar cost averaging yeah you guys can see my screen correct so you can read on this okay i think this is going to be my last slide so how many of you have the habit of reading Yeah. How many of you read? Okay, I think Anvita reads. What do you read? What are you reading, Anvita? Right now, uh, I actually read novels, but okay. right now I am reading a self-development book. Cool. How many novels? How many books do you read a month? Ah uh, no, like last year I completed my tenth, so I had a break in between. But usually a month, uh, one book or so, like two hundred pages or something. One book or one book? Yeah, yeah. One book a month. Okay, excellent. Cool. What about you? Anybody else has a habit of reading? Anam, like, do you read? Uh, not a habitual reader, but if I find some kind of good book or a good novel, obviously I I don't say no to it. Okay, cool. What about you, Mina? Do you read? I used to, but I moved the last two years. I haven't been reading much. Okay, what uh, what did you read in the past? Novels, so uh, and back then some self help books. Yeah. Okay, excellent. What about you, Shahid Priya? Uh, I read, but not like you know, or regular. Like, you know, rarely I read. You rarely read. Yeah. Do you want to be a leader? Yes. If you want to be a leader, you should be a dash. A reader. Correct. So readers are leaders. 
Okay, cool. So, Magesh, you read? Not much. If Not you find much. A, if I find a nice book or something interesting, I'd probably sit and finish it off. Cool. Least. What about you, Karpia? Do you read? Yeah, like I read only one book uh, till now. Other than that, uh, just uh, news articles or some other uh, school textbooks, let's see if I could remember. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. Karthik, you want to add anything? Do you read? Uh, yes, sir. You read? Okay. Uh, I read story books a lot. Story books? Okay, good. Naga? Naga and Omar, you guys read? I collect a lot of books. I have not jumped exactly into the habit of regular reading. Okay, cool. So guys, reading is very important. Okay, I think um, I'll tell you, I'll also recommend some books if you are especially interested in business and entrepreneurship. These are some good books. So you know who this guy is? Jack Welch. Anybody knows? Uh, might be wrong, but he was a past uh, CEO of General Motors. Is that wrong? General Altric, yeah. General yeah, yeah. I think I really enjoyed that book. I think that's a great book. And uh, so, again, G may not be doing that well today, uh, but uh, it talks about the history and his management style. So, that's probably one of the very first books I read. Okay. So I just want to share that with you. You guys know who this guy is? Robert Iger. How many of you like Disney? Everybody? Okay. I think, uh, so the, it's, it's a very inspiring story. Uh, so this guy, Bob Iger, he started at a very, very low rank. I think he was um, picking uh, packages or in trucks and then delivering and things like that at Disney or at the company he used to work and then that got acquired by Disney and then he went on to become the CEO of Disney. It's a very inspiring and a good uh, entrepreneurial book also, okay? And another book is especially if you guys are interested in tech, okay? So there's a book called How Google Works. So I think all of us use Google, but it'll also be interesting to see how they run the company. So these are three books I would recommend, but definitely develop the habit of reading. I think especially reading, investing, all this uh, are uh, interesting and uh, quick uh, learning things, yeah? Anybody has any questions on the reading or anybody else wants to share anything? Something you have read or something we need to know? Okay, The Art of War, Robert Kioski books. Okay, that's interesting. Thanks for sharing that, Singarava. There's so much to read. They say, right? Katra the Kaya Lava. Yeah, it's very true, actually. I don't know, there's so much to read and so much to learn, but uh, yeah. So pick the right ones which you think will actually help your career and uh, make that happen. Okay. Uh, book that I recently read, I think, would be a great read for a lot of us. Uh, so it would be uh, Shoe Dog by Phil Knight, the founder of Nike. And I think it's a yeah. very honest and very, uh, uh, very, uh, very grounding memoir of his entire life. So um, yeah, I think, and it is a product driven company. And since I think a few of us are in that space, it might be of, of, of help. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, what do you do, Pushpalli, again? What do you do, I said? You said you work at where? Or you're studying still? Uh, yeah, currently I'm just preparing for my GRE. GRE, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think that's a great book. I've actually read that book, um, Shoe Dog by uh, the Nike founder. I mean, it's very interesting. You know, like you said, it's very, uh, he started uh, in a very, very humble background. But then it's very interesting. Nike is a big brand today. But actually, they started trading shoes. They bought shoes, I think, from Japan or uh, something like that, and then they shipped it to the US. They were just a trading company. Can you imagine? And then they he turned it around. So that's actually a great book. Yeah, Shoe Dog. That's also a great name. Yeah. All right. So cool. 
Okay, guys. So any other recommendations? Okay, guys, I think that's all I have. Okay, and uh, thank you again uh, for coming. I enjoyed chatting with you. And uh, if you would like to get in touch with me, it's easy to reach me. I'm on Facebook and uh, you can send me an email or you can even visit my blog, karthikshadamaram.com. Okay, take a look at it when you have time. And uh, yeah, if you want to connect with me, I'm on LinkedIn and uh, Twitter and Facebook, okay? Cool, that's all I have. And I think we're also out of uh, time. So I'd like to really thank everyone for coming and uh, spending your Saturday evening, okay? With us, but it was a good learning. And uh, I think we also learned from each other. So it was amazing that way, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vadik. I will ask formally to give thanking speech by Vignesh. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I think it was a very uh, interactive and uh, enterprising session because for uh, our children, you made them very comfortable to talk to you. They were very, uh, you know, uh, comfortable chatting with you and understanding things from you. So, Thanks for doing this for us. It's a very odd time for you in the US, I believe. So yeah, thanks for coming on, on board and doing this for the kids. Uh, appreciate it totally. And I also thank all the students who participated in, the, in this uh, interactive session. Hope you guys, uh, you know, got something out of this. And uh, if there's any questions, further questions, I, I'm sure Karthik will pick them up offline. Um, so you can still keep in touch with him and uh, whenever you have any questions or doubts, you can always reach out to him and uh, I'm sure he'll be uh, more than happy to help you out. Uh, help you guys go through your journey in your career. Uh, that's it from us. Uh, if there's any, uh, I just sent a video link on the chat. Uh, that's about savings and how, how important savings are. Uh, we were talking about investments, right? I just wanted to just uh, request you guys to see that video, which is about how do you, you know, build a savings for yourself? So savings is the first part of an investment process, right? So uh, I wish you can, you know, save from an early age because this the age that you are in right now is a, a correct age to start saving. And then comes the investment part. So apart from that and the books side of it, um, there's a book uh, called Rich Dad Poor Dad, which is very useful for all the, you know, from the investing point of view, you understand how you make, your money work for yourself. Right? You you have your career, you make money, and then your money should all also work for you. Uh, so that's that's one book which teaches you that. That's very basic, so it's a good read. Uh, so I just wanted to just uh, throw that in as well. So once again, thanks, uh, Kartik, and thanks for doing this for us. Thank you, Kartik. All right. Thank you, guys. Good thank, you, you. Yeah. thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Anand. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. You. Bye. Thanks, everyone.